Well, good day, folks. Here we are, uh, drawing to the end of April. February, March, April. My February, March, April has gone by lickety split. I don't know about where you, how you feel about that, but it hasn't. Just so grateful again to be here with you, uh, bringing another message from Psalm 119. As we are now getting down really to the, the end of it all, next week will be the last sermon in the sermon series, The Path to Life. Thank you for having me in your places, and um, I pray that uh, you are well. And uh, let's take a good look at Psalm 119 again, to get, again, 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 pardon me, um, again together. One of the uh, sites that I like, or one of the magazines I, uh, I, I certainly enjoyed over the years is Popular Mechanics. And came across this information on popularmechanics.com regarding the USS Gerald R. Ford. Now, this is one of America's newest aircraft carriers. And as I was looking through that material, that article, uh, it certainly has some impressive dimensions. For example, the carrier is 1,092 feet long. I suppose, depending if you're in Canada or the United States, that's at least... Well, I think in both countries, that's at least 10 football fields long. And it carries a crew of 5,500 Navy personnel. That's like a small, uh, very small city. The USS Gerald R. Ford, uh, R. Ford pardon me, can hold its, in its hangars up to 75 aircraft at a time. This supercarrier weighs in approximately at 100,000 tons. And all this adds up to me wondering uh, just how you huge the anchor and chain would need to be to hold this 100,000 ton beast steady in the water. Well, it turns out that the anchor and chain system aboard this supercarrier is indeed massive as the ship itself is massive. The anchor itself comes in at 30,000 pounds. The chain is 1,440 feet long. That's a pretty long chain, and each individual link, link on that chain weighs 136 pounds. Well, you can do the, the math for yourself, 1,440 feet times 136 pounds, and you'll figure out what it weighs. Now, dictionary.com describes an anchor such as found on this supercarrier as any device drop by chain, cable, or rope to the bottom of a body of water for preventing or restricting the motion of a vessel or other floating objects. We also know that the anchor can be used to identify and describe other things as well, such as the primary presenter on a new sports or media production. This person is called the anchor. Anchor can also be used to describe a person or a thing that can be relied on for support, stability, security. One might say then, in this case, hope was his only anchor. We go to Mark's Gospel. And we find in there Mark describing an event where the disciples found themselves in a familiar fishing boat, as some of them were early first century fishermen on that Lake of Galilee. And they were on that fishing boat in the middle of what Mike described, Mark, Mike, <laughs> Mike had nothing to do with this. Mark described as a furious squall. Uh, these kind of windstorms on Lake Galilee can arise quickly and without warning. Uh, this phenomenon happens due to the large difference between uh, the height between the surrounding land and the la la Lake of Galilee itself, which is over 600 feet under uh, below sea level, which in turn causes large temperature and pressure changes. And we find in Mark's description of that first century squall that the waves were breaking over the boat and it was nearly swamped. Now, while all this was happening, Mark uh, reveals that Jesus was in the stern, that is, the, the, the back part of the boat, sleeping soundly. So we put together the pieces from Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, and we realized the disciples were afraid for their lives, and they cried out to the sleeping Jesus for help. Well, Jesus awoke and he rebuked the storm and it became immediately calm. Then Jesus said to his disciples, 
Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they responded, I think in an interesting way, when you consider it. They said they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You find that account in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 35 to 41. Well, now we can turn to Psalm 119. We pick up our scripture in verse 161 through to 167. This, as I mentioned, is the second last sermon in the series. And next week we'll be uh, finishing off with the last eight verses. Verse 161. Princes, prince, princes, persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord. I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this, this word that is before us. We ask you by your spirit to help us understand uh, what it is teaching us today in our context. And may it only not only teach us, but it would change our hearts, become more and more like Jesus. I pray that we will be malleable, that we will be uh, obedient to your word, and that we will trust you, Lord, in all these things. We pray these things for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, we begin once again looking at our stanza, verse 161 to 167, from a bird's eye view. See, what we want to do is we want to understand the context first before we take a closer look at these verses. For, example, for context, context, context is the number one rule in understanding the text of the Bible. And it's from this view we see that the psalmist was still on the receiving end of persecution. For he said here in verse 161a, princess, persecute me without cause. So this is the first point. The psalmist was still dealing with adversity. And he was dealing, my friends, as we know and said before, a real life situation. These princes or rulers in his context were the adversaries that had brought affliction into his life. And he said that he, they did so without cause. We find these same rulers earlier in his prayer in the psalm where the psalmist said, Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will mediate, uh, meditate on your statues. That was back in verse 23, early in our time in this psalm. Again, whatever the source of the psalmist's trials and tribulations, we can take away from the context he's still dealing with affliction from his adversaries, and it was without cause, according to the psalmist. Well, this brings up a question. Where was God in all of the psalmist's troubles? Because nowhere in these 176 verses do we find God answering the psalmist's prayer by removing his persecutors. Maybe that finally happened, but that, that would only be pure speculation on our part. So just as a reminder for the, probably the third time here, the psalmist was, uh, overall context here, we find him still in his trials and tribulations continuing along. Last week we found that the psalmist's lament had by verse 153 intensified, that in his prayer he had presented his case. This ancient, godly servant of God had pleaded that God would defend him before his enemies. And we discovered not only the nearness of God in that prayer, that is God, that is God coming alongside his word, bringing life to his servant in the midst of his suffering. We also discovered what the psalmist experienced in his suffering. We discovered the great mercy of God toward his people when they were in trouble for the psalmist said, Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. That was back in verse 156. Today, as we look at this stanza, we find the tone has changed. Of course, it doesn't jump out at us 
It's not loud, if you want to put it that way. Yes, the adversity continues, yet the tone has changed. And the first clue of this change is found here at verse 161b. Despite his adversaries, or maybe because of his adversaries, the psalmist said there in verse 161b, he said, But my heart stands in awe of your word. My heart stands in awe of your, at your word, of your word. This word heart in context here is not addressing that amazing pump we have underneath our ribs, moving hundreds of liters of blood throughout our bodies on a daily basis. That's an amazing work that is happening there in our physical hearts. No, this is the center of a person's spiritual activity. This is the location of a person's conscience. It's his will or her will and desires. This is the very soul of a person. And it's from, a time, it's from this time of adversity that the psalmist's heart stood in awe of God's word. Verse 161b. So we see here that our first clue, something was changing. Now we go to verse 62 and we find our next clue. The psalmist said, here I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. This phrase here in this verse, great spoil, is, is translated by the NIV as great treasure. Notice also the verb rejoice in this sentence. The original Hebrew here meaning to exalt, display joy, to be glad. So the psalmist in his trials responded by displaying joy, by rejoicing in the promises of God that he found in the word of God. Again, we have this question, what do our clues lead us to understand in this context? These two verses in our stanza, we discover the psalmist in the midst of his trial and tribulation rejoicing. In other words, he was full of joy. Remember the question? Where was God in all of this? Well, the answer we find is God was near to his servant in the midst of his affliction. That God in his mercy was defending his faithful saint against the lies and false accusations from the rulers on down. So I have a question for you to consider, to ponder. Would you say that the psalmist was blessed? How about this question? Do we find anywhere in these 176 verses that might suggest the psalmist enjoyed the trials and tribulations themselves? That he enjoyed the false accusations and slander? That he enjoyed the mocking for his devotion to the Word of God and his trust in God? You can check for yourself, but we can say, I think, with confidence, no, he did not enjoy. He's not a masochist. Because, folks, when you think of suffering, in of itself, suffering is not a blessing. So let me ask you a question. In the midst of your troubles, where is joy to be found? When the bad news is really bad news, where is peace to be had? Consider this question as well. How would you define blessing? How, do you, how would you define blessing? Now, Sarah Phillips asked the same question in her blog. So what is blessing, she asked. You know, maybe you talk about all the good things in your life as blessings. Or you describe your feeling blessed. These kinds of blessings are usually focused on concrete things of life, like our jobs and our kids and our homes, and our health. We think of blessings like this in concrete ways. But when we think of blessings like this, what happens when we lose our jobs, our relationships, our health, our family, our homes? Are we then not blessed? So what is blessing? Back to our text. We can ask the same question of our psalmist. What is blessing here? in this situation. You see, the persecution remained, yet the psalmist was in awe of God's word. The trouble remained, yet the psalmist rejoiced at the word of God. 
The psalmist said, I hate and abhor, or I hate and detest falsehood. I hate and detest lying, to put it another way, but I love your law, verse 163. He described the word of God like one who finds great spoil, or as the NIV translates this, great treasure, verse 162b. So what's going on here? Well, folks, if you remember one of the features of Psalm 119 we discovered is that the word of God reveals the nature and character of God. In other words, the word of God is a self-revelation of God. This is what is called in theology uh, special revelation. God, through human agency, has chosen to reveal himself in the pages of the word of God that he inspired the writers to write. So we want to keep this in mind as we turn to Matthew's gospel, and specifically to chapter 13. In chapter 13, we discover that Jesus uh, was describing there in that chapter the nature of the kingdom of heaven to his disciples, and he was doing this by the use of parables. Jesus describing the truth, truths of the kingdom, kingdom of heaven in three sets of parables. For our purposes, we're interested in one of two short parables that teach the same lesson of the immeasurable value of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said to his disciples, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. That's Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Well, let's go back to our text and the, and the question that we ask, what is blessing? Well, as we said, we might say that God has blessed us with health and happiness. Is that blessing if we don't have our health or we're unhappy? Going back to Sarah Phillips' blog, I think she was onto something when she said this, quote, the more I explored what God says about being blessed, the more convinced I've become that blessing is really not to do with earthly benefits at all. Well, let's go back to our text. We see there again. The adversity remained. The persecutors didn't go away, but the psalmist said, seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Verse 164. And are we to understand that the psalmist stopped what he was doing seven times a day to praise God? Or are we to understand the psalmist in the midst of his affliction praised God for his word? You can choose for yourself, but it seems to me that the praise of this Old Testament servant of God was grounded in his trust in God and his word all day. And in the midst of this praise of God and his trust in God's word is where the psalmist was blessed. It was in the valley of affliction that the psalmist, while rejoicing in God's word, that he was blessed. So much so that he would even say here, Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Let's look at this word peace in this verse. The majority of Bible translations, most likely the one that you have in your hand or on your app, translate this Hebrew noun here in this verse as shalom, or this Hebrew noun, shalom, pardon me, as peace. Shalom, when we look at it, is a very important term in the Old Testament. It is found 237 times in the Old Testament and in various contexts can mean a number of things. For example, completeness, soundness, welfare, peace, prosperity, peaceful, just to mention a few. But it's interesting, it's interesting, it's interesting, pardon me, to note that of the 237 occurrences in the Old Testament, the majority usage carries the meaning peace, peaceful, or peacefully. Well, returning to our context, I think we can cross-reference to get a better grasp of how shalom is to be applied here in verse 165. You can go to Psalm 1, if you want, in your Bible or in your app. We find there in Psalm 1, in six verses, a contrast between the righteous and the wicked. The righteous, like our psalmist here, are close to God and trust his word, or as described by Psalm 1 in this way, blessed is the man who, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, 
but delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 1, uh, Psalm 1, verse 1 and 2. Now, I, I didn't put it all there together, but you can read that for yourself. But the wicked, contrary to the righteous, are far from God, and do not delight in the word of God. But the righteous of Psalm 1 are like a tree planted by streams of water, so that yields its fruit in season. The wicked are not so, they're not that way, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Psalm 1, verse 3 and 4. And God knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Psalm 1, verse 6. We can go to Jeremiah, chapter 17. You can turn there if you want. God here was dealing with Judah and their sin. Speaking through the prophet Jeremiah of the unfaithful and apostate Judah said this, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness. That's Jeremiah 17, verse 5 and 6. And then we find a contrast that's similar to Psalm 1 and certainly similar to Psalm 119 as we found there as well. Blessed is the, one, the man who trusts in the Lord whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water, does not fear when heat, when heat comes, for, it le for its leaves remain green. It does not cease to bear fruits. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8. Back to our text again. The psalmist had not been removed from his tribulation, yet here in the midst of his troubles he rejoiced in the word of God. He had maintained his commitment to the truth of God's promise, promises and hated the lies of his persecutors. Nowhere does it say that it was easy or enjoyable. Yet the psalmist continued to praise God because of his righteous and just decrees in his word. Where is the blessing all of this for the godly servant of God? Sarah Phillips in her blog said, quote, It is so often within the sphere of suffering that God bends and shapes our hearts to become more like him. That is a blessing, end quote. She goes on to quote the 19th century preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who once said, anything is a blessing that makes us pray. See, our psalmist was like the tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Psalm 1, verse 3 and 4. He was like a tree planted by water, does not fear when he comes, for it leaves, its leaves remain green. It does not cease to bear fruit. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. You see, Sarah Phillips was right when she said, quote, good gifts are enjoyable here and now, but blessing lasts for eternity. Shalom, the psalmist discovered in his affliction, was the great peace of knowing that God was near to him. That God was protecting him and encouraging him and surrounding him with his covenantal love and doing a good work for his good and the glory of God. And that nothing could make him stumble, for he loved and trusted the promises of God in his word. We can turn to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5 and 6 specifically, where he described his motivations for bringing the gospel message to them. It was not out of conceit, nor was it out of any way of a sense of pride or even eloquence, but it was for the love of Christ, Paul would say, 2 Corinthians 5.14, that he brought the gospel to them. You see, for Paul and his friends, they had concluded that Christ died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This would, move, this would move Paul to consider no one that he met or ministered to from an earthly point of view. And he would say this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and 18. And this, my friends, was the reason Paul and his fellow missionaries implored the Corinthians on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. See, Paul went on to say even more. He went on to say, now is the day of salvation. And I say that to you, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. 
Nothing could cause Paul to stumble. Paul, like our psalmist, a servant of God, commended himself to God, as he said in his own words, in every way. 2 Corinthians 6, 4. What ways? Well, he goes on to tell us in that letter, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. 2 Corinthians 6, 4 and 5. And how did he do this? He did it by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness. That's how he did it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Where was the blessing for Paul and his fellow missionaries? Well, the answer is very clear. For the love of Christ controls us. So as we close this off, let me ask, are you at peace today? Or have your afflictions and troubles caused you to stumble maybe? Is your heart desire motivated for the love of Christ? And to use the analogy, is he your anchor today in whatever is going on in your life or around you? Or does something else control you? Maybe your fear, maybe your sin, maybe something else. Do you trust the word of God? Do you really trust it and believe it? Do you even care to turn a page of his holy word? You know, Jesus said to the disciples as he he was preparing them for his arrest and impending death and also to their own uh, soon-to-be persecution. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John chapter 15, verse 1 to 5. Is Jesus your anchor in the storm? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that it brings us in our trials and even on the top of a mountain where we're singing for joy and everywhere in between your word is true and it's good for us and i thank you lord for it i pray for my friends that are listening to this i pray god that you would bless them from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet that you would be their comfort and their joy whatever is going on in their lives would they put their full and faithful trust in your word and in you, Lord, that they would follow you until the day they are called home. Oh, Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, God bless. Shalom.